John Hitler is a seasoned entrepreneur and CEO coach who understands the unique challenges and pressures of leading a successful company. His track record includes working with top tier companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, X, Zynga, and Tango. John's coaching promises a significant return on investment with a guarantee of a 10x ROI on both money and time, or you don't pay. Your previous book, The Little Book of Big Scale, counterintuitive practices for exponential growth. Could you talk high level? What are some counterintuitive practices for exponential growth? The number one most effective one, we didn't rank them one to five. We just put the five in there. But the one that's most most effective for scaling versus not scaling, and it's counterintuitive, especially in this culture, is to hire top talent with zero regard for your culture. If you can hire somebody that's a badass, fill in the blank, engineer, CFO, salesperson, support person, doesn't matter. If, if you can do that, don't worry about uh, babying your culture or stressing your culture. Because if that person can break your culture because they're different than other people, your culture sucks. Now, here's where this comes from, and this is what the book is about. If you interview people that are starting their company, they go off-site, they get really drunk and smoke dope, and then create their core values and their culture, and they say, oh, this is going to, we're going to have the best company ever because we've got a cool culture. The problem is that eventually your culture is only as good as your worst day. And if you're starting a company, you've got bad days coming. You're not planning on them, but every company has that. What does your culture do when the fit hits the shan, as I like to say? Well, we'll find out what your culture is about because it's not about kindness when you can't make payroll. It's not about like, or when you got to fire your best friend or all that stuff. What I did was I interviewed exiting CEOs, people that had an <laughs> exit because they're the ones who made it through the gauntlet. And I said, tell me the truth. Well, uh, the question I asked originally was, you hire for talent or culture? And incoming CEOs say, oh yeah, you hire for culture first and then worry about talent. So what you end up with is talent as a secondary feature. These people all said the same thing. Some of them said everything from our culture was a dumpster fire to our culture was fine, but it wasn't any better than anybody else, uh, everybody else's. But our talent, we kicked ass. And if you think about it, think about sports teams or anything else, eventually, if your volleyball team has really, really, really great talent and mine has okay talent, even if we have a way better culture, we get along better, you're going to kick the crap out of us most times because you just have way more talent. And people get, some people call that provocative. I call it counterintuitive because it's it goes against what you'd normally think. More, normally you'd think have a mix. I was going to say it. I would think that the ideal is to have all those talented people cooperating and pulling in the same direction. And I think of some of the top sports teams and usually the coach is some whiz who manages to get these like two number one players uh, basically setting aside their legacy thoughts and, and working together. That's the leadership's job is to say, wow, we got we got David who's left-handed. He's a left-handed, unbelievably great talent. And we got John who's a right-handed and they don't get along with each other. Neither one's ambidextrous. What are we going to do with them? You say, we'll take them both. We'll figure out how, because it's talent is talent. And what the real, the real trick would be is to say, how do you guys work together? How can you work together? Where David unleashes John's talent even more and John unleashes David's because together we can build something better and more interesting, more fun. Then we'll get along. We'll get along just great because we're going to connect on a talent level even if you're right-handed, I'm left-handed. That's right. Uh, so do you have any recommendations for how we can smooth that transition from zero to 100 of being tested? It's a great question in terms of what do you look for that is um, not connected to a specific bad day, but specific to, oh, David's done mountaineering and he climbed Mount Whitney and almost froze to death. That's super helpful on the days when your when your company is in on fire. You got the there's open flames and there's no way to put them out. What do you do? Who who do you become and how do you survive and then ideally use that as your catapult to your next big achievement? That's that was a that was a, a hallmark. That's quality 
or a value, I would say it's a quality, not more a value. Because you can't ask, you can't say our values are resilience. Because if somebody's a wussy and they don't have any resiliency, telling them that we're all about resiliency won't help them. You need to hire people who have done things um, that would make them resilient. Gee, did they serve in the Marines for four years? Oh, they're going to have a level of toughness that you and I probably don't because the Marines toughens you. Cool, for better or for worse. How do you engage those people and how do you find the attribute you're looking for authentically? That's different than saying we're all about these four values and then asking you, do you have those? Of course, people are going to say, sure. To a certain extent, I have all those four values. I agreed it with those. They're good. Are, is there any weight in telling people what you think your skills are? Or is, does you, do you just have to demonstrate? And the reason I ask is because when you mentioned looking for resilience, and I think of the most resilient people I know, they're not really screaming that they're resilient. They just have a certain confidence and self-assuredness about them. And like you mentioned, where you know, kind of looking in, walking in the room, who to look out for, like you can kind of tell how that person can handle themselves. They've been through through it a couple of times. But I was curious, is there any point to um, advertising some of what you think your attributes are or do you just keep your mouth shut and do? I'll paraphrase, but there's a, there's somebody who said, uh, there's no reason to tell us who you are because we're watching what you do. So somebody who quits at the first sign of distress, you know, low on the resiliency scale, low on the perseverance or, or toughness, first of all, you cannot make them a team leader. And companies do it all the time. These days, especially, they'll say, oh, well, he's empathetic. That's really good. And you say, empathetic's great. But what happens if you've got a six-month, you got two full quarters of being under full attack where everybody on your team threatens to leave because it's so difficult? Empathy ain't going to help. Uh, we need you to be tough as nails and also engaging enough to say, stick it out, guys. It's going to be worth it. If we can get through this six months, I promise you it'll be worth it. That's a different skill. And if you have that, do you even tell people? No, they'll say, wow, of all the teams, David kept his team together better than anybody. And that's because he had this combination of, of these talents. Uh, some skills can be taught. Talents you usually have more naturally. But did you were you able to hold your team together? And what process did you use? If somebody says, I'm all about empathy, great. If it's 100% empathy, that's probably not the best skill set if you're going to be under attack for a prolonged period of time. Because empathy just means, oh, I know you're having a tough day. I, I understand. You can do that. That's really great to do when they have a tough day. But you can't say, I, I understand you've had a tough quarter. Uh, just so you know, you're going to eat more of that crow for for the next three quarters at least, and I don't know when that when that's going to happen when that's going to end. Empathy won't help there. Um, they'll say, "I think I'm going to float my resume. I think I'm going to resign. It's too it's too difficult." So I'm I'm a bigger fan of observing people, and you see this in um, in hiring. Most of my CEOs, when they have a C-suite challenge now, and I recommend it, is that they have two or three candidates that they like. Get it down to the two or three they like, and give each one up paid assignment over 30 days, like a side gig. If they're working somewhere else, a side gig, because they'll surprise you. You'll see how they work. Uh, you interview the people they worked with and see what their process was and say, where that's way better. And it'll save you a lot of trouble than hiring the person with the best resume or the one who has the best interviewing skills, which may not be useful in the actual job. That's gold right there. Obviously, you know that, and you, you this is what you do to, to I mean, one of many things you do. But I, I fully relate to that. I, I've, my company just passed a year, a um, couple months ago, and I've, I've hired a few people, and I've gone through every single hundreds of resumes myself for each application because you never know which one. Maybe the next one's going to be the one. And sometimes it gets really hard. They could have the perfect layout, the perfect like way of writing, and this is even like pre um, op op uh, uh, generative AI in some cases. Um, now it's even more so you can have it like, give me a resume like this. And, you know, it's really hard to differentiate on a two dimensional level. Then you bring them in for interview. Uh, and like you said, they could they could pass the interview in flying colors. Um, and it's almost like playing a character. Like sometimes you see some of your favorite actors being interviewed and it's like, whoa, where, who, 
who is that? Like, I, I thought I was going to see this character that I fell in love with. And it, it, here's like an empty vessel waiting for their next role in some cases, some of the best actors even. Um, and so it's, yeah, people are complex. And that's that come and you know, you're trying to hit a moving target from a moving platform, because uh, you yourself are complex, and you're trying to um, project out into one or two years of uncertain variables. Um, that's, and yeah, I think you have to draw the line at some point. What I've what I've done is had a 90 day probationary period, which might be a little bit um, inefficient. I think 30 days is probably good because then you could have three, uh, basically equivalent, the single probationary period for 90 days. You could have th three people doing that in 30, um, get good at your up, like your testing and then hire the best person. Again, it, there's probably still surprises, but I'd say that's that's a better way of going about it. Well, the the, the trick was, and we, we tested this and people did it as an assignment, but with no pay. And it was like the, what they were testing is, are you willing to invest in yourself and bet in your, on yourself? Which I get that. That's more of a sociological experiment. I suggested that they pay them. It didn't matter what the pay was. It wasn't going to be one twelfth of a CEO's check or a CFO's check or a C CRO's check, but give them an assignment that they could do while they still have their other job. And what, it, what they have to do to succeed is to do a good job at it and, and, Finish the pro first of all, finish the project. What they found with some of them that with, was they would come in a week later and say, I just couldn't get it done. <laughs> or a week late and say, I, I just couldn't finish it. And you say, thank God we didn't hire this person. Because every project they get or every promise they make, we're going to hear the sad, sad story about how they couldn't keep it. They looked good and they uh, on resume and they interviewed really well. And thank God we dodged a bullet there. And then you usually it's uh, someone who has surprisingly humble personality that they say, huh, that quiet one, we liked them because they, you know, they were very pleasant and kind of, kind of low, um, soft spoken. They kicked ass. They, they got, they got to work and did, they, they wowed us. And the team said they were really easy to work with. They loved working with them and they would work. Uh, that was, that's one of the questions you asked the team that has to work with them. Would you like to work with this person? And if people all said, we would love to work with this person, not because they're a pushover, but because they engage them. You think that's a, that's a hugely relevant before you actually do it. Cause now they're on a, you pay them on 1099. You say, I'm going to pay you, pay you five grand to do a 40 hour project. And you can, uh, you, you can get it done over the next three to four weeks. And here's your hard deadline though. They made sure there's deadlines and milestones and it's a bake off of sorts, but relevant. There are these interesting trade-offs I find in nature where the bigger something is, the more momentum it has and the more that it can do, but the harder it is to course correct. So if you think of like a big ship trying to get out of the way of an iceberg or something like that, it's kind of like a big institution that has a lot of weight in the brand and we kind of outsource our critical thinking to the brand, but it's not always um, easy for it to iterate real time with the chaos of the jungle. Um, and so obviously both are kind of necessary. You do need the institutions, but at the same time, uh, I think you have to have your critical thinking cap on firmly in order to thinking like, does this serve me in this case? Um, what are the pros and cons of, uh, being wrong in this instance, et cetera? Well, our political system right now is a perfect example. People are outsourcing their thinking to a party and saying, gosh, I can't vote for fill in the blank. It's the same rhetoric on either side. I can't vote for so-and-so. So I'm, I guess I'm going to vote for this one. What you're really doing is saying, I can't think for myself. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to outsource or abdicate all of my decisions in a bundle, everything from immigration to women's rights to whatever, because they're on both party agendas. I guess I'm going to take the good with the bad with this party and candidate instead of this one. I'm outsourcing my, my ability to my own thinking. Hmm. Why should the party set that? Why should this party have a platform that you have to abdicate or or sit under instead of saying, "Hey, how about if you did an open forum and we raised our hand and said, this is what we'd like you guys to do?" We don't work that way. They say, "This is our platform. Vote for us." Yet your thesis is that every single human being has a unique, inimitable talent. There's only one of you, only one of me, and you know there never will be and never has been another one of us. And your superpower, one of the things that you do that no one else does, or well, it's just that you you help people find what you call their genius talent, the the thing that they're born with that maybe they don't probably they don't even know exists, and then you help them identify it 
and then hopefully uh, nurture it and, and uh, use it. Could you talk a little bit about about what that is, uh, your, your offering and how you came to discover this? Sure. So I, I had this sense kind of my whole life, but really as a young adult, um, like like early 20s, other people could do things that I couldn't and I could practice the rest of my life and I would never be as good as them and vice versa. And I also looked at the places where I had succeeded when I shouldn't have. And we've all had places where you say, wow, I surprised. I, how did I do that? Huh. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then I noticed they all had a theme to them. And so I came up with this idea or notion that maybe we're endowed with a what, what I now call a genius talent in our DNA. Why not? I mean, scientists still don't know everything in our DNA. The trick is, if it's in our DNA, kind of like if I ask you, you know, what, what uh, most people I could ask in their blood type, most people can't a- answer that, let alone what's in your DNA. Why couldn't you have an embedded genius level talent in every cell of your body? That, and so that was the notion I went with. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then how would I prove it? One was I started figuring out, I figured out a process to tease that out of people. And I, what I noticed is, and I've done it with about 7,800 people, something like that, individuals, I've never found any two that are alike. Because I don't, I don't come to them with answers. I come to them with questions. And then they end up giving pieces that you can start putting together and say, well, could it be this, this, and this? They go, how'd you know that? Oh, you you told me. No, I, didn't, I never said that. No, you never said it in one coherent sentence, but you had every particle of it, and it kept showing up in all of what you were talking about. It kept repeating itself. Well, I, I figured that out, and my theory from the beginning was we won't take something like homelessness. Homelessness is not going to be... Um, it's not going to be solved by a government or a nonprofit. They're too close to it. And if they would have funded, they had all the funding, they've had all the chance to do it. They've just made the problem bigger and maybe worse. It's going to be solved by somebody who sees the world in such an odd way that no one has ever thought to even ask the right questions. And they're not going to be a homeless advocate. They're going to be a just some random person who has the perfect skill set. So if we could tease out everyone's genius talent, my theory has been you'll solve that's how you'll solve all the world's biggest problems with individual people who see the world in such a weird way that you can't not say where did you come up with that did, who do you work with are you part of the government are you part no why don't we just do it this way they say that's brilliant where did you come up because to you if you if you've got that way of seeing the world you cannot not see that the world that way and that's what it will take to, to solve big problems. So, What are some of the, maybe one of the discoveries that are as most surprising with all the hundreds of people that you've helped? I mean, you don't have to say who it is, but what what's one of the genius talent discoveries that you thought was most profound, either for the client or just for the world in general? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I can, I can share language. I can't, I can't tell you the person, most people wouldn't know, know the people, but Rarely do I remember them a week later because I do so many of them that I couldn't keep them all straight in my head. But some of them are so profound. My favorite of all time, and this is the simple version, this is the talent she got, but not the process she uses. Her talent is uh, connecting individuals to their divinity. And I thought, what a beautiful way to even language it. Uh, She's an atheist, which made it it, it, it made sense to me that she was an atheist because she doesn't see religion. She sees sacred or divine. What if she can connect? And, and what, what she, the way she sees people or notices intuitively is uh, David's, he's disconnected from his, his highest divine self or his, his sacred nature. And what she does is she connects people to their divinity. I thought, not only is that beautiful, but inc- imagine healing people like that. They'd be healed forever because all that ails them is this disconnect about, uh, talk about social media, who I am on social media and who I really am uh, when I'm not on social media. There's probably a gigantic gap for a lot of people. Oh, everything. Who I am in the grocery store, who I am in the car, who I am with my grandparents versus at school, whatever. Exactly. What if you were, what if you were living in your divine state most of the time completely changes your life and that's what she does and i thought 
what a beautiful, even the, the, the articulation is just gorgeous. Um, but you'll get those, you get these, every one to me is surprising and interesting and fun. And some of them just stand out because I don't, I don't remember most of the, what people tell me because I just can't hold it all after, after doing about 50 of them. It's not that they, they mel meld together. I just go, uh, David, which one was he? David was the guy from so-and-so. Oh yeah. He's the one. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. And if you tell me what the genius is, I remember the whole session. But if not, I say, well, I've done four of them since. I, I can't separate them out. Sure. That's understandable. So regarding your work as a CEO coach, what, what are some of the big lessons that you've taken in the years and decades that you, that you've done this? What, what's that like a common theme that you see where we just, we keep maybe making the same mistakes or there's like low hanging fruit that we could just have an easier go of it. If we just got this one thing, right. It's a, it's a great question. Um, we talk about genius talent There's a process for coming up with yours. The biggest mistake I see, and it's more pronounced now than ever is following a model that isn't authentic to you. So these days it's very popular to say, oh, I, I try to do like Elon or I try to do like Bezos or I try to do like, um, Jamie Dimon of, of what JP Morgan, but you're, you don't have the same skills, abilities, and talents. And oh, by the way, you have much more useful ones than they do in the area that you have more useful skills. You're going to have, you're going to win or succeed by being all of who you are at your best, way better than being 50% or 20% or taking three of Bezos's ideas, but not understanding the Bible of his ideas. You're going to pick the three randomly and say, oh yeah, I got this from, from Bezos's best practices. doesn't mean you can't copy him. That might help. But is that going to be authentically your best vehicle to take your job and, or your role and maximize the results of it? Um, that's the biggest one. You have to play your game and that game can be almost anything. You could be a healer. You could be rough and tumble. You could be a, a magician kind of, you know, you see some of these archetypes. Who are you and what do you do absolutely better than anyone else on the planet? Now run your role as CEO through your talent instead of trying to take the role and have that dictate what you have to be good at. No, like I'm not great with spreadsheets. I can apps, I'm on board. You have to look at them. I understand them. I can do them, but they're painstakingly too difficult for me. As a CEO, what I needed was the three metrics that I could run the company with. And so I'd say, okay, great. I see you gave me an 11 page tabbed indexed spreadsheet. Uh, here's what I need to know. What's this number, this number, and this number, because that's how I could tell thematically, are we winning or losing? And I could cut to the, the heart of the matter really quickly. I couldn't do that if we had to go into the into the guts of it. I just couldn't do it. Now, other, other people would be just the opposite. They say, I need the detail to understand where we're at. Neither is better or worse. Neither is right or wrong. That's just going to work in a way that I could be really effective or it would crush me. Uh, it's just, which, which do you, which version do I have to play? You mentioned the word effective again. That's but I was going to borrow that touching back on what you said earlier, because I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. If you have a goal and you're testing what's going to be the most effective way, one of the things that's, that I struggle with is finding the balance between uh, growth or learning something new versus playing to my strengths. Because if I play to my strengths, I find I'm more competitive. But if I learn something new, I'm often like overlooked or underestimated and it's frustrating, struggling, you know, but at the same time, I never know how that struggle might pay dividends later. So it's this, you know, it's almost like a grab bag of effort versus, uh, you know, the sustenance of playing to your strengths now. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? I suspect I know the answer, but how would you rate yourself in terms of I'm curious or I'm not very curious? I'd say I'm highly curious. I don't know if it's a one to 10, I'd put myself somewhere around eight. Yeah, that's that would have been my my inclination. And I know, I know you a little bit that way. And I, I think that's a super good attribute to have to be a beginner and say, oh, I need to develop this skill because it's required. Or I've always wanted to do fr French pastry. You don't say, I'm only going to do it if I can uh, be the world's best 
French pastry maker, you say, wow, my first croissants are probably going to suck. But what will I learn from that? And and that's okay because you're curious and say, you have context then to say, oh, I'm a beginner. My job is to ask questions and make mistakes and get, and my second ver as long as I, my second version get, is better and I don't keep making the same mistake over and over, curiosity is super helpful for that to be a beginner and to be an expert, curiosity, it won't, it won't hurt, but maybe you need a different uh, playbook for that. On the things that you know you're really good at, um, your ability to influence others might come from confidence instead of from curiosity. I'm making that up. But it's just a different, it's a different um, way of being a beginner versus uh, what you might call an expert or somebody who's very, very competent, highly competent. Um, some people are only good, most people are only good where they're highly competent because they don't have to get embarrassed. And people with a beginner's mind, as we call it, very useful because, I mean, just take anything in the last five years. AI is, can you avoid AI? You could postpone it for a little bit, but sooner or later you're gonna have to you're gonna have to dip your toe in and become capable or competent at least at a decent level of interacting with AI. Oh, you can't just say ah, it's not for me. It's not that's too sci-fi. I don't do that. And you go, the whole world's gonna be AI. Well, if you're if you don't have a beginner's mind or a curiosity about it, it's just gonna look overwhelming all the time. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about that. Um... That's you know deceptively deep because I think it's not just about AI, but it's I was thinking back in my own kind of life and people have, around me. So many times you could be frustrated with the environment and demanding that it changes to meet you where you're at. You want to stay and you have to adapt. You you have to recognize um, the timing for different gears. When to be curious, when to be confident, how to develop authentic curiosity and confidence. Constantly testing, iterating learning from the data. There's so many variables. It, uh, you know, it's not a fire and forget sort of system. You uh, you need to participate in it and hopefully find the joy in it because uh, just like brushing your teeth, you know, it's, you're going to have to keep doing it. Right. And some stuff, you don't get a choice or there are big consequences. Brushing your teeth is a perfect example. Don't brush your teeth for six months and see what happens. Not, not great. Um, but other things, you have an option and the curiosity or might be ambition as well. Those are really valuable to have. Ambition isn't always valuable and isn't always desired, but curiosity and ambition are generally two good ones. Um, and curiosity when it's a mandate and a memo is detested. No one wants your questions. Damn it, we want you to salute and go execute. Oh, okay. well, I have a question. No questions, go execute. This is an execution not um, a whiteboarding session. It's just the wrong methodology. So, you know, we all have that. Uh, our our natural inclination might be useful or not so useful. What do you love about your job? Uh, the best thing is it it takes full advantage every day of my genius talent. So essentially, what I what I get to do is get up and having a uh, a supreme advantage over pe other people that might do the same thing. But I get up and say, oh, I can't wait to get on a call, my next call with so-and-so. We, um, My coaching partner and I today came up with, as he, as he called it, a harebrained scheme. We have to be in the room on Monday with a merger. Two companies haven't met, they're merging. And he came up with a, a quote, a harebrained scheme. I had to sell it. I didn't have to sell it. I had to um, introduce it to the CEO we work with. And he loved it. That's just fun. Now he could have said, I don't know. I don't know that we start with that. We would have just gone back and done something else. All the whole process is super fun. But he said, I love his exact quote was, I love it when you're harebrained. If you have a harebrained scheme, you get punished for it. They say, stay focused. And part of my genius talent is a high level, includes a high level of creativity way out, like not a box. There is no box. It's, it's like, it's not in this galaxy. And you go, that stuff works sometimes. Hey, that's what I love about it. Because it takes full advantage of my quirky genius talent. Does every CEO need a coach? No, um, and I'll I'll ask that uh, differently too. Are all CEOs coachable? No, and some are better without a coach because they're 
on a scale of knowing, like they're intuitive and they know, better not to coach them. Let them do work, work instinctively. They'll do better than if they have a coach. Um, it's, I've always thought you could always improve with help, but for some people it actually uh, stifles them. So yeah, it's a, again, it's an unusual answer coming from somebody that coaches CEOs, but yeah, not everybody, not everybody needs or does better with a coach. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. That, that kind of makes sense. And how would you discover that? Like, is that something that you can figure out like in the first 30 days or it's something, you know, like you said before, you just walk in the room and you're like, that person's not coachable. I, you can usually figure it out in the, in a, the first 15 minutes of a, of a, what I'll call a meet and greet. Cause I'll get referred to CEOs and they're surprised when I say, uh, cause they're, they're thinking I'm going to give them a pitch. And after 15 minutes, I say, if I were you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste the money or the time really. Cause they're thinking, cause that's not what I was supposed to do. Um, the, the, and if they're curious enough, they'll say, why, why do you say that? And I say, well, you're a knower. Um, this will actually stifle you and slow you down. We could try it. And I'll ask them, do you want to try it? And oftentimes then, then they'll want to try it because I said, you shouldn't do it. They'll want to try it. Is there anything that we didn't touch on regarding uh, CEO coaching or leadership or talent versus skill that you feel uh, would, we'd be remiss not mentioning at this point? Yeah, here's here's what I'll uh, suggest. And you and I didn't discuss this, but you have an audience. And if somebody's interested in discovering their genius talent, I like to game game um, gamify things. They send a one sentence answer to you about what they would do if they actually could discover their genius talent. Um, we usually charge three, three grand to figure it out. Have your audience, if they're interested, I'll do a genius town. I'll, I'll put that into the pot. And their only job is to say, if I knew mine, here's what, here's what, here's the benefit or here's the difference it would make. And you pick the winner and I'll, I'll do their genius town. Deal. I'm curious to see what, what will we come up with as well? Yeah. Well, we'll have fun with it. Too. It's, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah, it definitely. And I did it with you. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I highly recommend everyone does it. There's a lot of growth in those uh, three hours. Where would you like to point us? Like, where should we check out what you're doing? So I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm I'm uh, fortunate enough that with the last name Hitler, you, I don't have to tell people how to find me. No one has the SEO except me. So um, yeah, you'll find me really easily. Anything I've ever done, including my fourth grade attendance record is online. Uh, for all to see. And then, uh, yeah, so I don't compete with anybody on SEO and I don't pay any money to, to get it either. So. Maximum courage points. Uh, well, thank you, John. Uh, fascinating as always. Look forward to our next conversation and uh, please keep it up. All the best.